pandemic and uh, mental health taught me one thing that I need to be part of a solution. If I can help one person, like affect them so they can lead a happier, healthier life, then it's all been worth it. Hello, welcome to episode five of Jukebox Jacks podcast. Uh, today I am joined by Felix. Felix so- is. Uh, the front man, it's fair to say front man. Yeah, if you like, whatever yeah. you like, man. <laughs> front man of Old Selves band. Um, a lot of people have been asking a lot of questions about Old Selves due to sort of promo stuff I've put out about the episode. Um, but yeah, just give us a, a little bit of a rundown of you, as in not just music, but professionally, what you do, etc. So yeah, so uh, my name's Felix, um, I'm from Yorkshire. I'm a registered mental health nurse. Um, I work in a crisis team um, in an unnamed trust in an unnamed city. Um, and uh, I qualified as a nurse. Uh, when was it? It was last year. Um, but during the pandemic, so I finished my, my career during the pandemic. Um, it was a very busy time. Um, I've worked in mental health for... I think it's about eight years now I started working in a medium secure forensic hospital again which I will not name <laughs> um, and uh, I got into that just by chance really I was 18 years old and my dad's a mental health nurse a lot of people in my family are mental health nurses um, and he basically said right you need a job mate so I was like right yeah I do <laughs> uh, he was like just go work here on the bank you'll earn a grand a month I was like a grand a month that's amazing so I went and did it um, <laughs> And then sort of two, three weeks later after working on the bank, which is like temporary staffing, I applied for a permanent post as a healthcare worker. Um, and, and I worked there for, for six years, as I'd say. Um, and after that, well, during that time, actually, I decided I wanted to be a nurse. I decided quite quickly that I wanted to be a nurse. Um, and it was a struggle to get to university because I had GCSEs and they weren't too bad, but I didn't have A-levels. So I think like yourself, mate, like, you know, yeah. um, you know, you had to find alternative routes in. Um, so I did that. I went and studied my nursing. Um, I discovered what crisis teams were. I thought, wow, um, you know, they do some amazing work. They do some amazing preventative work. And um it was a very compassionate team and is a very compassionate team that I work in and I was privileged enough to get a job there um that was just before the government announced the coronavirus as a pandemic that I got a job there quite literally like I interviewed for it two days before um (laughs) and then and then after that like obviously as everybody else's lives did my life went into a bit of a whirlwind and it was like whoa covid what's happening with my degree will I qualify like what's happening um and sort of reflecting on the past I guess you'll probably ask me more about COVID later but I guess like reflecting on the past sort of year there's there's one moment that really sticks out to me and that was when I was sat watching the TV and Matt Hancock was on there and he was like right we're gonna we're gonna draft student nurses out uh final year student nurses and and they're gonna be out on the front line as he called (laughs) it it all very dramatic and sexy (laughs) (laughs) And, and I was like, right, okay, flip an egg. Okay, so then I was like sort of religiously checking the emails like every five minutes, like what's going on? Yep. Um, I think the university had no forewarning of it. Like that's what they told us. So ah. they had no forewarning that, that he was going to turn around and say that. So obviously the university was like on their backsides, like trying to reply to people with absolutely no answers. <laughs> and it's sort of like, where, where are we going? What's happening? Um, I then um, went and did my like final placement with the team that I got a job with, which is the crisis team, um, which was very lucky, very fortunate. And I know a lot of people didn't get to do that. Um, so I feel like I've been in this place for quite a long time. Yeah. So I, I, I worked in a community mental health setting during a pandemic, which was interesting because um, the way that we delivered care has uh, changed a lot and it's still very much sort of changed. Um, a lot of appointments and consultations and, and whatever you want to call them were done like this. Uh, so over video chat, that was a massive barrier for, for people receiving care and for, for me, like giving care to people, um, especially, you know, during or shortly following a mental health crisis, because 
there's a massive divide there. You know, we can see each other on the screens, but it, it, you don't get that real human connection as, as, as you would face to face. So there was a bit of that. Um, we did see some people face to face in certain circumstances. Um, so, so I sort of muddled my way through that and, and now I've been qualified a, a short time, um, qualified, registered a short time. And we're sort of coming out of this mess, <laughs> and 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 my career is sort of going back towards what I expected it to be. If that makes sense, yeah. yeah. Um, and the job that I applied for, and the job that I really wanted to do in this team, it's it's getting closer to what I expected it to be now. And that's not me saying that it wasn't amazing when I started, because it was. Because you know it's you were caring for people during the pandemic and yeah, that's horrible. And, and anyone that needs our care in the crisis team is obviously in, in a circumstance where they're, they're not doing so well. Um, but it was exciting for me as a professional because it was like, wow, like this is intense. This is exciting. Um, so yeah, that's, that's me. And that's my, that's my career so far in, in a, in a um, and then the flip side of that, which I often call my alter ego, <laughs> is, <laughs> is the, as you say, front man of old selves um, who are a metal band. And we're from, we're from Yorkshire. We're actually from three different places in Yorkshire now uh, in terms of where we live. And we're, sort of, we're spread across. Um, and we are heavy. Well, heavy for us, to be honest. We're not. We're not heavy, but we are. <laughs> we we sort of came together when we initially formed. We we formed as a as a pop punk band. Believe it or not, um, I can see it. I can see it. <laughs> there, was, there was different people involved in the project at that time. Um, different influences, and um, I'm not ashamed to say it. To be honest, I sort of drove it towards a heavier sound because that's what I wanted to do. I thought been in a few bands in the past and and sort of done okay but then flopped and I just thought I'm not going to be in another band unless it's going to be exactly what I want it to be like a like the you know like the diva that I am so (laughs) so I said right guys we're going to make this heavy let's make it heavy let's scream let's 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 chug let's do riffs um and that's what we did um and old selves are now sort of coming out of lockdown having changed a lot in lockdown because we changed members recorded a new EP did various things coming out of lockdown with a lot of gig bookings like a lot um and and good prospects so it's awesome i'm feeling uh, very fortunate at the moment as as yeah. a human being in terms of my career and, and my band life so yeah i think i've answered the question this always happens <laughs> in interviews and podcasts it always happens doesn't it because like they ask a question you go off on a tangent and then you're like did they actually answer the question? <laughs> no, mate. That 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 gives people a pretty good nutshell in terms of you um, and obviously what you've been doing. It was quite interesting that you touched on that bit uh, when you were saying about obviously with COVID and stuff because that was going to be one of my questions to you. That um, I know, obviously, like you said, because you were coming in obviously into your final year and such, and then you went obviously as would be your official first year as a placement, even though, like you say, you've already been doing it or from the academic side transfer into professional the things that you'd have previously been made aware of in terms of the, the one-to-one care uh, for people struggling with mental health um did you see any benefits i'll, I'll touch on the benefit side because obviously the negatives will just jump out of everybody's head anyway to start with but did you see any benefits to the, the people using zoom using teams using things like that as a way of connecting did you, did, you, did you feel some of them cases they were a little bit more open about how they were feeling compared to if they were sat there in front of you yeah yeah i would say so and like like you say it's very much on an individual basis and i guess i saw it for, for it, in individual cases i saw it really work for some people some days and really not work for some people other days um what I found was, and I'm not fully answering your question here, but I will. Um, what I found was, um, if I'd met someone face to face initially, yeah. so I'd met them for an hour or, or a bit longer initially, and then I'd done a video call with them later later on, sort of the next day or a couple of days later. Yeah, that would yeah. just go really smoothly. It was great because you built that initial rapport, which is yeah. so important, yeah. and which is what you know, it's what they bang on about in in nursing school. <laughs> 
it's it's developing rapport, developing that that therapeutic relationship, and you've got to, you've got to do some groundwork there to begin with. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like you say, some people uh, really liked it, especially over the phone, where you didn't have to look at anybody. Because I feel like there were. Oh no. Can you hear me, Felix? <laughs> no, I can't hear you. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Oh, I can hear you now. Yeah, I've just put my buds in the, the case, so can you hear me okay? Is the quality all right? Yep, spot on, mate. I'll slice it. I'll slice it. Do you want to ask that question again? Uh, yeah, I'll uh, I'll try and condense it because I felt I rambled a bit when I said it, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so in terms of obviously the, the level of um, patient care you were able to deliver during obviously pandemic in terms of obviously a lot of patients would have having the first direct contact would have been via zoom uh teams things like that so did you see any positives to that compared to negatives yeah yeah i did see positives for people um i think as we were saying it's very much on an individual basis so i think uh for some people it, it was quite helpful um in terms of they didn't have to go through that sort of anxiety build up before before an appointment where they'd have to sort of get themselves out of bed, get ready, get dressed, that kind of thing. And I guess mull over and, and get into that vicious cycle of anxiety about seeing a professional. Yeah. Um so, so so for example a telephone call, it would just be a telephone call. I wouldn't be able to see them, I wouldn't be able to do that visual, I guess, assessment and they wouldn't be able to see me. And I feel like because they just had my voice, there was that disconnect, but it was a healthy disconnect. Yeah. Other people, it was negative. And, and as you say, you know, the, it's easy to focus on the negatives and it's probably quite easy to pick them out of, of that issue in terms of not being able to see people face to face. Um, but yeah, I think it was helpful and unhelpful in a lot of ways. Um, I think it, it's hard. I want to say it was more unhelpful but that again that's completely down to individual preferences and experiences um as a professional and this is no secret you know we don't keep secrets we part a big part of our assessment is what we see and and in people's homes as well you know and there's there's been times where i've, I've visited people and seen in the recycling box there's like 50 cans of empty cans of Stella and like 20 empty bottles of wine. And I've asked them if they've got an alcohol problem. They've broken down in tears and said, yes, I need help. Yeah. And and I couldn't do that from a phone call, you know. Yeah. And that person got help with their alcohol issue. And and that was just from me being outside their house. <laughs> so I guess it's there's many pros and cons. But I think a lot of people would say they prefer it because, as I say, there's less anxiety build-up and there's also less... Some people like it to be less personal because they have to speak about very personal things. So if they're just speaking to a voice and they're just offloading all this stuff to a voice, I guess it probably would be a lot easier. Yeah, it were... Um, I mean, I, I, would, I suppose... I mean, there's no way of knowing how someone's going to answer something, but I would... Yeah, I was thinking you that you'd probably say that because it's quite interesting that it it was quite relatable to the studying side of things, uh, which you'll, you'll obviously you'll know anyway, how it's, how it normally works in terms of obviously degree preparation and stuff. But uh, for us doing the access course, yeah. we literally, I think September, we started our access course and um, I think in that was obviously September last year. And then we got through um, Christmas, obviously went into the situation that we're going on. And then we weren't we weren't back in. So a lot of people had signed on with the premise that they were going to be getting a full kind of like tutelage, one to one, get the support. Because a lot of these people were coming. I don't know. Some of them might have even been fifty year old, not been in education for years and years and years, and they had concerns about it. They had anxiety about it. 
And yeah. now they were having to go on to just using Teams. And then they were also the first to say, I don't, I don't even, it takes me literally 10 minutes to find a Y on a keyboard. Like, and now you're having to rely on me to go on to Teams and connect that way. Yeah. So it's transferable that way as well. There were a lot of people that were that were anxious about doing the studying online when they'd not necessarily signed up to do online. So then it's quite interesting to hear that he's saying in terms of obviously people's care plans that, that you had obviously for the community that you were working in and stuff with a similar sort of challenge where in some cases individuality steps in and there were positives to it, but there were also negatives on the flip side. And then the next time you saw them as well, it might have worked yeah. well first time but then the next time they weren't really able to open up as much internet connections and and such getting yeah. in way exactly um, that's it and 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 i've been in many situations where we've been chatting like this on a, on a video call and like the signals dropped out and then i've not been able to get in touch with that person <laughs> for the rest of the day and they've clearly just gone ah oh, fuck it <laughs> like yeah. and, and it's and for me that's like oh no because, like, you know, we were having a real good conversation, or maybe we weren't, but at the same time, those are both big red flags for me. Like, if somebody just disappears and they're just hacked off by the fact that the technology is not working, and if that, if we'd have been face to face, that would have never happened, you know? So, yeah, there is that it's, I'm going to say it's going to, it's going to be challenging, like you say, if you, especially in them, them cases where you're actually making headway in that conversation, and then all of a sudden it drops out. And then your first concern isn't about, oh, no, you know, I'm not able to do this with them. It's a case of I've left them halfway through a conversation when they've made so much progress. But now yeah, yeah. How, are, how are they in their state of mind? Like I've, I've unlocked a lot of things and helped them unlock a lot, of, a lot of the thought processes and stuff like that. And now they're just left there quite vulnerable in that sense of how are they going to now react to it kind of thing. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. And it can take people years or a lifetime to to say some of the things that they do say to me. And uh, wow, that's a massive privilege for me, but flipping heck, you know, if it's taken somebody a lifetime to, for example, and I don't want to go down a dark road here, but for example, to disclose some childhood abuse or trauma, yeah, yeah, you know, and they start to do, this hasn't happened, I just want to be clear, no one's actually said this to me and then it's dropped out, thank God. But if that were to happen, that's a risk, isn't it? But um, yeah. Luckily, you know, the NHS has invested quite a lot in, in sort of um, the technology and, and, and a platform, a, a specific secure platform to do this on. But it has happened a couple of times. Um, and it's happened especially over the phone, you know, if you speak to someone in a rural area or whatever, and they start speaking to you and telling you things because you're having a telephone call. So it's a double-edged sword, really, because you have a telephone call, maybe they feel more comfortable. You start speaking about other things and then the call cuts out <laughs> it's, like, yeah. it's a nightmare really isn't it it's yeah. you can't win in a lot of ways because in them cases i guess it's it's i think you touched on it a little bit earlier i mean i'd imagine the situations like that where people respond well to the to the less formal side of you know the telephone calls and they open up probably a little bit more than they need to, like the intended to but then the next appointment they've got with you is a face-to-face and then straight away the guards up and it's like oh mm. i've got i've got a teeth like Felix now and I can't believe I said that to him last time and I don't feel no I don't feel comfortable so then you kind of hit a barrier as soon as then you try and connect face to face is the if it's if you're going down I mean I'll I'll learn more obviously once I start in degree myself but I suppose the the academic and the curiosity side of me in them situations would be would is it worthwhile not forcing the force to for uh, the face to face in that situation and just adapting them conversations, you know, telephone or whatever, if you feel you're getting more progress yeah. with them. At the end of the day, you know, you know, patient preference comes first and if it's safe and if it's fine for them to do them, that's absolutely fine. If it's, if somebody doesn't want to see you face to face, but they're happy to engage with you over the phone or whatever, then that's absolutely fine. Yeah. And, and it's funny that because before that wasn't really something that was offered like at all, it was always face to face that's what's happening but we've got to see people every now and then but if, if that's what they choose to do then absolutely fine yeah there's not too many situations is there during this whole pandemic where we can take any sort of positives out of anything that's gone on you know people have lost family members and, and such um 
But there is certain situations where you can kind of look at a whole industry, not just in the healthcare setting, but professionally, where beforehand you'd have had a lot of people, you know, you know, top officials within certain industries saying no, especially if we talk about nursing, for instance, they'll be sort of like, no, there's got to be that level of face-to-face care because we have no evidence that the other side of things actually helps people. Now we're in a situation where we've got nothing but a plethora of evidence yeah. of showing how much distance um, care as such can be beneficial to certain individuals, not to everybody. Like we say, individuality is different, but that I think coming out of it is going to make um, the healthcare setting better in a lot of ways because there is then people like individuality that'll that'll open up more in them situations where they're not face to face. They don't feel like they're being judged because that's a lot of time. That's why they've not opened up to the friends and family as well because they're afraid yeah, that, yeah. that a person might sit there who they're talking to and be sort of like, "Oh, I'm fully supportive and I understand everything that you're going through." But as soon as they divulge something very personal that they've not told anybody that that, that shocks the person they're listening to, they can't hide that shock reaction initially. And even though the words are nice, what they're saying to the person that's opening up, that shock yeah. on the face, they see it straight away and they're like, I'm, no, I'm, I'm not sharing anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, one thing that I found um, recently, just sort of going back to what you were saying about people sort of closing down in face-to-face contacts and stuff, is um, just being straight up with people. Like, we, oh, never mind professionals, never mind nurses, doctors, whoever. Just human beings just being straight up with people and i often find sort of recapping on past events is always helpful so you know i'll see somebody and i'll say that we met last time this is what we spoke about we don't have to go into too much depth about it but let's just acknowledge it we have that conversation you know and that's fine let's not pretend that it didn't happen or let's not pretend that we both know about it but no one wants to talk about it like <laughs> We both know, but that's absolutely fine. And the more you acknowledge things, and that's the same with everything in mental health, you know, the more you acknowledge it, the better and easier it will be. Yeah, because obviously it's vital once once they're in, you know, they're in them situations where they've opened up that bit more and they don't they've already taken even the smallest of steps forward. You you want to reduce anything that's stopping them, they either stopping in the tracks or going backwards in that sense. Yeah. Um, were there any other things you kind of noticed with during the the COVID situation? You know, as, as hopefully we're coming out of it. Um, you know, like the the day to day workings. I know, obviously, you've said about distance learning and things like that, but obviously there were a lot of other you know protocols in terms of additional PPE and all them things. Because yeah. um, yeah. from conversations I have with a lot of people. I suppose the, and I suppose you, you've experienced this as well. They've got quite a, a narrow field view of exactly what mental health nursing involves. They still have the idea that they just picture you in a, on a ward delivering a baby when someone says nurse. They don't mm. they don't understand the wider like you know specific like you said the community roles and stuff like that. like. Sure. Yeah. How how is that different than the generic ward type setting that people would imagine? Yeah, 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 sure. So, I mean, it's, it's it's still a fresh topic, isn't it? And it's it's difficult to know what to say sometimes. But I mean, you look you look at the 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 heroes on the the ICU wards and the people that were wearing full blown PPE, you know, twelve and a half hours straight throughout the pandemic, and you think, wow. Um, and and we got a taste of that. We've got a taste of it, but not nowhere near to the same extent. Um, if someone had COVID in the community, we won't we won't go anywhere near them. Simple as that. In, yeah. in, unless we've really, really had to, you know, in in in, in extreme circumstances. Um, but my experience is sort of like the PPE and stuff. Like going back to like the face to face stuff in in the the thick of it, in the thick of the pandemic. Yeah, we go see someone face to face. But we'd be wearing gloves, apron, visor, face mask, all that stuff. Imagine that. Like we'd we'd go and visit pe- we'd go and visit people with a first episode of psychosis that were terrified of the world. 
and we'd turn up covered in plastic. We'd be like, now then, I'm here to help your mental health. <laughs> <laughs> Straight away, yeah, the alarm bells are ringing. Like, uh... yeah, 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 precisely. And it felt weird for us. And it's about doing it sensitively, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and luckily, we're not we're not having to you know fully gown up and wear the visors and everything now. But um, yeah, so sort of going back to your question about the the difference, and I guess exploring people's perceptions of what nursing is um i think it's so it's so hard it's so hard because i can't even i can't even sort of translate what i do to my wife you know i can't even translate that yeah i I can't even translate what i do to my dad who's been a mental health nurse for 60 36 years wow because he's never done my job do you know what i mean i I can't like he, he what he said to me he was like what that service exists. It was like, wow, if that existed when I qualified, I'd have loved to have done that. But yeah. in his day, it was wards. It was wards. And then you had you had your CPNs, your community psychiatric nurses, who are now called care coordinators. Yeah. Um, and, and that was it. That was that really was it. And and I don't know a lot about the history of CPNs, but you know, even then, the understanding of what a CPN did was they'd go around they'd inject people with the medication, they'd have a cup of tea with them, they'd make sure they were all right. And that's people's perception. I'm not saying that's what they did. I just want to make that clear. Um, So it's it's really hard because people only understand what they can experience, I think. Yeah, that's fair. Truly. They only truly understand what they can experience. And nearly all of us have been in a physical health hospital, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. Even if it's not not as an inpatient, but we've visited someone there, or or you know, or we've walked past and we've seen the nurses <laughs> wearing their uniforms having a sig. Do you know what I mean? Like we know <laughs> yeah. that that's what you see a nurse as, you know. And it's and, yeah. and sort of me and and my colleagues in our chinos and our you know, and we're just like <laughs> like bombing about Yorkshire, seeing people in the homes for the mental health needs. Anyone would look at me and go, "You're not a nurse." Like, you know, unless they've got that sort of inside knowledge. Yeah. Um, so it's so hard. And I think it's getting better. It is getting better. I think what helps with that is the documentaries that there is. I think there was, there's been a couple of documentaries about crisis teams and different things. Um, and that, that interests me because a TV company, for example, like Channel 4, would find out what a crisis team is and go, oh my God, that's so interesting. We need to make a six part documentary about it. And, <laughs> and that in itself just shows how little people really know about them or even know about their existence. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's a weird one. And I think it's probably better. My boss said to me the other day, she might actually watch and listen to this, but she said to me the other day, and it resonated with me because I'd said it to a couple of people in the past. And they say, what's a crisis team? What do you do? And we say, just count yourself lucky you don't know what a crisis team is. Yeah. And it's, and I think that's, that's fair enough. And I think that's probably a good response. Um, because, yes, it's important people know where to turn when, if they're in that situation, if they're in a mental health crisis. But actually, if you don't know what one is, that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, it, even if your family members, if it's not necessarily the individual that we're talking about, if it's family members, things like that, watching a person go through what at times they've got, and I, I've still got, obviously, limited knowledge as such, but probably more so than rest of the general public because of, obviously, the academic yeah. side I'm going into, but... Yeah, I mean, it was funny that you said about documentaries. I mean, I, once once Sky News play something, they'll play it to death, and they, they've been playing it the last few days where the the following a cams team that's dealing with uh, obviously there's I think there's a young girl who's one who's got eating disorders, but she's actually uh, self harming at the same point. Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's like a forty minute thing, but it keeps it's probably going to be on again tonight. It won last night. They just keep playing it on loop and. I think it's for me personally. It's all it's all well and good, you know. Uh, TV channels, people doing documentary when it's in the news, mm. but it, we need to help be helping that awareness all year round. It's it's like the 
mental health awareness week or you know the month as it is in america we should never sure. put them days or months at the end of that sentence it it should always be there because mm-hmm. I, I personally think that that is what helps people open up more when people aren't that bit more sensitive to the mental health issues that the fa- the friends the family the work colleagues might be going through just for one day or just for one month and at rest at time yeah. that they don't kind of it's not there the emphasis so I, I think that that's one of the things moving forward that needs to sort of change because it you know it's all right for one week out of 52 weeks a year <laughs> to make it a paramount yeah. 100% mate and with children um because obviously that's that's one of the things that it touched on with that documentary, the fact that now coming out of this global pandemic, yeah, there's going to be mental health issues across the board, but it's specifically children where there's alarming rates, you know, mm-hmm. percentages of people, children seeking help finally. But then you've got to add on top mm-hmm. of that the statistics of those that are still suffering in silence in a way and not, they haven't actually been diagnosed with anything or they haven't even been to a doctor's for treatment. Yeah, hundred um, percent, mate. I think in in mental health assessments in the future, one of the questions will be how old were you when the when the COVID nineteen pandemic happened? Because that is going to be crucial in terms of people's development and people's. I guess, I guess people's. I hate this word. I hate it, but people's resilience. Yeah, and and I guess understanding of the world because you know. The, the, the thousands, millions of children around the world that will be a, a key stage in their in their cognitive development and social development, and that have had to endure this for the past eighteen months, they're going to have a they're going to have a massive disadvantage, aren't they? And and that we're going to be seeing that for years, years and years and years and years, um, because it's it's a trauma for a lot of people. It's a massive trauma for a lot of people, and. I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm no, I'm no expert, I'm no scientist, but at the same time, I reckon in a in a few years' time, we'll we'll have a specific diagnosis for the after results of of COVID nineteen in most, terms of mental health. Most definitely, because I mean, that's that's a lot of things that's happened over years, isn't it? Where you know, you you'll you'll have a fourth generation from the same family that's now suffering, you know, with mental health conditions and, and illnesses because. There wasn't that adequate care or diagnosis in previous generations, so the awareness wasn't there. So then, when you get something like like COVID happen, I mean that that is literally how like my my path to my degree started because my first instinct. I mean, you'll understand this as someone in the field anyway. My first instinct was, well, yeah, it's really sad what's going on with people who I even personally know dying around me because of COVID the one thing that's jumping out to me at minute is the mental health consequences that this is going to generate. And then that's when I were like, do you know what? I'd made a conscious effort when obviously we decided to have the kids when we were young, I were like 21 at the time when we started. Um, and then I've just worked any job, anything that makes sure my kids were financially secure. It didn't matter. I'd, I'd, I'd had mopped floors, swept, whatever. It didn't matter. I put my own life on hold. I, I was originally having a year out before okay. I actually came into the whole, um, obviously meeting the the children's mum and stuff. So I was supposed to have a year out and then go to uni. Yeah, that I met her. That didn't happen. <laughs> so then, <laughs> so then we had the uh, so then we had kids and then I would sort of like like I say I had the conscious effort. I'll just work whatever jobs. I'll wait until they're less dependent on me. And then I'll pick mm. up my own studies again. I'll I'll sort my own career out. And then it yeah. when the when the pandemic happened, and I was just sort of like, do you know what? Mental health across the world is there's going to be a massive fallout from this. Forget the long COVID that they talk about with the physical implications. It the mental fallout that this is going to. So I was like, do you know what? If we are going to be in lockdown, because a lot of people originally when first lockdowns got announced, it'd be like, oh, you know, let's just just open in three months. It's all it's yeah. all past. And, yeah. And I'm I like, remember it, I, I, I remember. like, do you actually, I will like, even me, I don't, I don't claim by any means to be intelligent whatsoever, but I read a lot of things that like intelligent people have already got figured out. 
So that's why yeah, people yeah. get confused that I'm intelligent at times. Like, you're really brainy. And I'm like, I'm really not. I'm an idiot. I'm uh, an idiot. Yeah, instead of like, you can retain that information. <laughs> Say something about your intelligence. Yeah. So <laughs> I was sort of like, right. Anybody who knows anything about influenza or anything like that knows that it's an 18 month cycle at the very yeah. least. So it's like, so I was like, I'm going to use this time right. And so I applied to um, to Wakefield College, one of the local colleges that were doing well. Originally, I applied to Leeds Beckett's Uni, mm. and they they got back to me. I've got to send all my qualifications through. They got back to me, and they were sort of like, "Right, your qualifications you've got are good, and it would normally be brilliant, but because it's been eighteen years since you studied, your UCAS points that generate from it and." It wouldn't give you the total UCAS numbers. And I'm like, wait, so yeah. pe people could be now applying to university who's just come out of college and have the same on paper UCAS points that I've got, that we admit I have got, they're like, yeah, but they don't hold the weight because it were 18 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know a guy, I know a guy I used to work with who's now a nurse and he did the access course, but he had a master's in some mad like biochemistry <laughs> or something that he got in like Glasgow. But it was like 30 years ago. Yeah. So, so like, because he had this master's degree, it, it still, he wasn't good enough, so he had to do the access course. And he, he, he recalls it to me. He says, oh, I mean, we did this first assessment. It was like a 1,500-word essay. And they were, like, calling me and emailing me all the time, like, are you sure you're all right? Do you need more support? <laughs> you might be really disappointed with this, Mark, because you've not done any academic writing for a long time. He's like, I smashed it out in half an hour and I got 96%. <laughs> <laughs> so I hear you, man. It, it, I mean, I, how was the access course? Did you enjoy it? Because I, I didn't do one myself. I mean, the, the access course that, um, that I did is, is specifically named. I mean, the one thing I learned about the access course is that there's variances, especially if you're doing like distance learning from Open University, you can do access courses right. with them. But the one yeah. I did was access to higher education, healthcare professions. It's a very right. generic one. So on there, I've got my academic bubble group that I'm with. Um, originally, there was another guy, but he was going to be training to be a paramedic. He was a fitness instructor, a personal trainer. But he dropped right. out after what seems like a month. It was probably a lot longer into it. But the rest of them mm. are all girls, but they're going into different fields. Like one of them's training to be a physiotherapist, other ones midwifery. Um, then you've got adult nursing, um, yeah. child nursing. So the, yeah. they combine all these things. And there's me, and I think out of so we've got four academic bubble groups in, in our cluster, even though we are this is just us for that one. Yeah. Um, and I think there's only one other person that's doing mental health nursing after the access course, but she's already mm -hmm. working in a care setting. Me, like I said earlier, I, as much as I've had admiration for the field, I've, I've never worked in the health field. I've worked security and facilities manager sort of like roles. So yeah. as much as I've got an insight and I've always got further reading to be doing, Mm. It, it was always I wanted to, so I were coming into, and I, I were open with everybody, even sort of lecturer saying, "Look, I might completely be out of my depth, but don't don't worry about me at any point, like because I'm mm. I'm more committed than than anybody." Sort of like I first realized on paper, like does this guy know what he's getting himself in for? It's like I totally, <laughs> I've lived yeah, myself yeah. wanting to progress this for like eighteen years. So, um, well, um, dude, like, honestly, it's my observations is you're obviously a very passionate dude, which is the most important thing. That is so important because it's not an easy course to do and it's not an easy career as well. You know, there's way easy career, way more easy careers that you could get paid yeah. more for. Um, but it's, it's evident, you know, it's evident that you're very passionate and the fact that you sat here with the confidence to sort of talk to me about it and um, sort of knowing that you're level of knowledge which you put on the table is probably not as high as mine who's gone through the degree and is now doing this job is is great and I think that's really important and <clears throat> one thing that if I could like pass some wisdom to you yeah, and some yeah, sort of, yeah. um, one thing that's really important is to always put your com competence before your confidence always and quote that in an essay sometime and the marker will absolutely love it <laughs> trust me 
because it's part it's part of the NMC code, you know, being aware of your capabilities and and, and your competencies. Yeah. Um, but always put your competence before your confidence, and patients are fine with that. So service users, patients, whatever you want to call them, are fine with that. Always say to them, I don't know what I'm doing it here, but I'll find someone that will. Just give me a chance to do it. And they really respect that. I'm not going to go, oh, you're a shit nurse. Like, they don't yeah. do that. Some, I mean, some people might, but the majority of people don't because they go, all right, I really respect that. Like, I really respect that I'm not being, you know, I'm not being played and I'm not, I'm not being taken down a road that's, that's pointless because it's just sort of talking crap. Yeah. Because a lot of people can do it. You know, you can get a lot of professionals go in and to make themselves look good, but not actually do much for the person that they're caring for. They go and talk a load of shit. And it's like... We're back. I think we're back. Can you hear me? Did I lose, did I lose sound then? Yeah, it went a bit weird, yeah. It's fine. Oh, right. I, I okay. can slice Sounds it. Good. I can slice it. Yeah, okay. um, yeah no, it's, um, it's quite funny that you said that as well, because the... When you have your like your uni uh, interviews and such, they're one of the things that they kind of they never want to say it outright and admit it happens, but they touch on it by them scenario based questions. That what would you do if a patient came to you, asked you something, and you didn't know the answer, and then they oh. also divulge to you that they've asked someone before and it's been six hours and no one's got back to them, kind of thing. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I remember those questions. Very <laughs> well. Yeah, and it's sort of like, well, it's it just exactly like what you said there. It's the first instance. It's like, if I don't know the answer, just be confident enough to sort of say that to patients. It's like, look, I'm not claiming I'm something I'm not, I don't know, but I'm going to go off and find someone that does. Yeah. Whereas some individuals, arrogance is kind of the wrong word that I'm going for, but, I, that, but that's what, it's kind of in that direction where they're that arrogant in their own... It's pride. It's pride, yeah, mate. There we yeah. go. Yeah. So they, yeah, a lot of them people that they don't want to admit they don't know the answer, but they also don't want to ask the colleagues, and then yeah. they just hope that the patient forgets that they asked them, kind of thing. But then you've got a patient it's, that's just sat there waiting, and precisely, mate, precisely. And that's that's it, and it's really important that that people try, you know, newly qualified nurses or people going into the profession just take that on board. It's so important. It'll help you as well. It'll help you so much because. You don't want to be going home after a shift feeling guilty that you've left somebody without an answer. And you don't want to be going home feeling incompetent because, yeah. you know, that actually take that as an opportunity, use it positively, take that patient asking you a question that you don't know the answer to as an opportunity to find out the answer. So the next time that somebody asks you, you know it. And, you know, it's the people that take that attitude and take that approach that don't progress and they quickly become out of date. And they quickly become pretty, I guess, sour within their own careers. And that's not a good way to go because it's, at the end of the day, and this is this is brutal but true, people that can't admit to their mistakes or people that can't be honest about their competencies can end up killing people. Yeah. And that, that, that is the truth, <laughs> honestly. You know, if, if you can't, if you can't, do something right, or you don't know how to do something to get somebody safe or to care for somebody well, find someone that can. It's as simple as that. <laughs> because it's, that's it's, it. It's like you said with, with the pride thing, isn't it? I mean, I don't, I don't think academic studies and I don't think working in high-profile positions like working you know, as a mental health nurse in NHS, I don't think it's made for everybody. Um, no. You've got to have a certain character, and part of that character is wanting to learn more i always remember it's a like totally off subject but it does tie into it did you used to watch csi like crime scene investigation i've seen bits and bats yeah, yeah so you had you had a guy on there called gil grissom and he was in charge of like the obviously the vegas labs but then he had a, a guy coming up who were like who used to assess all sort of like the crime scenes called greg greg sanders and um Gil always used to try and impart wisdom on him, yeah, yeah. but he never used to listen. But this one episode, he, he actually listened to what Gil was saying, but it was a sarcasm in the exchange afterwards where he sort of like, he literally quoted back to Gil what Gil said to him earlier in episode. And he just yeah. looked at Greg and he's like, hey, that's my saying. And he's like, yeah, I absorbed it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's them, it's, them, it's them sort of relationships you want. Like a, you like you want to be working with people like-minded in that way that that don't mind if they don't know everything, 
and yeah. but they're also yeah. eager to learn more stuff and it you know just rolling something off a tongue might might be something that might impart a little bit more knowledge into someone else around you which as a team because it's never just about the individual it's about the team it it makes the whole team grow because everybody That's collectively it. is is up in the game, which ultimately gives back to the care of the patient because that's why everybody's doing it. It's the patient first and foremost, but God, it's got to be yeah. difficult in in nursing profession if you have, you've got colleagues around you that that aren't up to the standard they should be, but also haven't got enough pride in themselves to admit that they're not and they're quite defensive or. I think you were yeah. used the word earlier, stale as well. Yeah, yeah. And it's like you say, it goes back to the team. And there's a reason that so MDT, multidisciplinary teams, you know, that's that's a term you're gonna become very familiar with throughout your training. Um and I, I say training. I'm so I'm institutionalized. <laughs> throughout your education, throughout your degree level education, <laughs> you're not gonna find out what an MDT is because the reason that they're in place, the reason that you've got various different disciplines in a team is because, as I keep saying, if you don't know the answer, someone in your team will. So go and ask it. And that's that's why they're there. You know, it's, it, I'm sure, I'm, well, I'm certain, if, if the NHS or any other organisations could, I don't think the NHS would, but if, if, if an organisation could, because it's a, it's, it's a simple business principle, isn't it? If you could just get somebody out there working on their own, seeing people on their own, yeah. that'd be great, wouldn't it? It'd be way cheaper. But yeah. no, you, you've got to go in, you've got to get a hand over, you've got to see a discussion in the morning. I mean, you've got, you know what I mean? You've got like, you've got like half a million pounds worth of wages in a room on a morning for an hour. Like, do you know what I mean? It's yeah, like, yeah. And there's a reason that you do that. And it's because you need to have conversations. You need to bounce off other people. You need to get ideas. And it's not, although when a patient just sees you, yes, they're just seeing you. But actually, in here, you've got a conversation that you've had. You've got ideas. You've got a psychiatrist. You've got an occupational therapist. You've got a social worker. You've got everything. And, and, and that's, that's how we work. And that's the best way of working. And that was realised a while ago, and that's why the MDTs exist. It's not just a CPM goes to work, um, picks up the medication, picks up the needles and their injections and the syringes, goes around, sees people. It's not like that anymore. It's, it's you know, you go in, you have in-depth, meaningful discussions about people's care, and you involve those people in the discussions as well. There's a, you know, there's a lot of things out there that you're going to pick up during your course, and, and you'll be like, yeah, I know what Felix is on about, but there's a lot of stuff like the crisis care card at, um, the CPA approach. There's a lot of things that the government have put in place because they've realised that mistakes happen, Yeah. but they can be avoided with money. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, 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 yeah, the, 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 obviously the inner child in both of us when obviously we have to talk about adult things like money and stuff like that. Like, oh, God, oh, God. Especially when you talk about <laughs> governments, the inner anarchist in me always battles with the the government side of things. Um, yeah, yeah. but yeah, it, it's it's where it, it does come down to you know we we grew up in a in, you know in we've all grown up in a world where it's emphasised to us that it's not all about money, but it, but it is you know money mm. opens up a lot of other avenues, especially in the nursing field. It, you know, you better source of equipment, you better, you know, your money that's put aside for, you know, your further researching and things like that. Wages, Jesus Christ, wages. And don't get Let's me wrong. Let's not go down there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's like not like any any of us ever want to come into this profession because we, as first instances are, oh, want to be paid a full whack. Like, yeah. openly, like, I stay away from them things. Like, I'm, I'm never doing never doing anything because it's financially motivated as long as my my mortgage is paid that i'm i'm fine like I, it's like you were saying like you've sword. you've gone through life sort of making sure that your kids are cared for and, and that everything's okay and, you know like good for you as well like it's your time now like you're doing something that you want to do and that you're clearly very passionate about so make sure you do it yeah then obviously i got me uh well, this were earlier on, like, what are we on now? We're on May. Yeah, we're on May. I'm losing track of all months here. Um, it's May. So I got my conditional offer from Bradford. Um, it would have been February. 
And obviously, right. you have up until June to, as you know, with the whole process, you've got until like June to, to obviously decide where you go in. But I didn't even entertain Bradford when I first originally went down this field. I, I had it in my head that Leeds Beckett's is where I need to do it because if I'm talking right. to anybody who works within the area, mm. they were all telling me the same thing. If you want to do like mental health nursing or any sort of nursing, you need to be going to like Leeds Beckett's because it's like the unofficial nursing hospital. And it's like, all oh, right, right. So I need to be aiming there. And then I quickly realised that as soon as I started at Wakefield and I started doing access course, don't get me wrong, a lot of universities do come in and try and give you talks. But from the moment Bradford came in, there was just something different about them. You could see that they were providing us a lot of support as people, especially as adult learners, where they kept ending the sentences with everything they're doing. Like, look, no one's saying that you're going to come with us. Our whole importance here is to make sure that you're fully supported and go on to your degree. If you go and choose your degree with someone else, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that if they're not giving you the answers, we'll give you the answers. And if you want to go and choose them, it's all well and good yeah. because you're going on to the degree and you're going to help people afterwards. And they're, as you've obviously, as you've already learned with me, they're people on my mindset level. It's never yeah. about the, you know, the, the personal reasons for something. So Bradford... They gave that level of support even when they didn't necessarily know that. And looking back now, I, I think I actually told them from get-go, it was like, yeah, I want to go to Leeds Beckett's. <laughs> I, uh, I, 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 really? I, yeah, I, a person in the room who said that, which is quite crazy. And, I mean, I, I, I can say it on here. I, I've, I've, not, I've not hidden it in that sort of sense. But, mm -hmm. I mean, Caroline, she, I don't know, she might shout at me after this, but it's gone the full switch of it now she's actually entered me into and this is before i even started my first academic year with bradford she's entered me in to be one of the um student ambassadors you know where you oh, sit yeah. in on webinars and obviously you yeah. give advice back to students and then when we come out of covid you'll be going to <laughs> colleges giving you know talks to them you know helping them for career progression and stuff like that. yeah she's put yeah. me forward for one of them so i'm actually going to be part of oh, that good. team as well which goes hand in hand, I know, for doing, obviously, the podcast and stuff like that. As soon as I mentioned yeah, that, yeah, she, yeah. Were, she were like, oh, well, you know, me and Tom will definitely have to make an appearance on that. And they were like, oh, I've already got you written down. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good, man. That's really good stuff. And and um, it's interesting, actually, you saying that about Leeds Beckett, because I actually heard the same things and I got an offer for Leeds Beckett. <laughs> and, and at the time, I lived in York and when I was... I don't live in the centre of York now, but um, when I was studying, I lived in the centre of York and uh, I got an offer for Leeds Beckett and I got an offer for York and I was still weighing it up and it would have been a lot more travelling for Leeds Beckett for me. Um, but then I changed my mind. Um, I, I don't want this to be a Leeds Beckett diss session. Um, <laughs> because the, way, the, the interview process was great. It was really thorough and like it was, they all, the staff seemed amazing. They really supported nice people. Um, but a couple of things that sort of York said to me, like during the interview and stuff, and 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 just the approach, like some people don't like this kind of thing, but like being shown in to do my interview, like my face to face interview for the degree, and the guy put his hand on my back, and I like, and I thought that was really weird, and like I, people don't touch me, or I don't like it, but but he did, and like and like you could tell that it like sort of sussed me out, and he like he, he thought it was okay, and like. And he was just being sort of really sort of supportive, and he like, and then I don't, I don't know who that guy was to be fair. It could have just been a random or off the street because I've never <laughs> saw him again. After all that but um, no, but just their approach and their sort of ethos, and it was the same thing. Like like you were saying about with Bradford, it was just sort of like, yeah, we're we're a high class university, and you know we're this that and the other, and we're a Russell Group, and but actually putting that aside, we're all nurses. We've all had varying different degrees. We're all different experiences. Um, at the end of the day, we want to get you through this course. We want you to enjoy it, which which stuck with me because with other universities that I'd looked into, they were like, there was nothing about enjoying it. It was like, <laughs> you've got the best nurse you can be. You've got to know all the evidence. You've got to know this, that, and the other. And I was like, whoa, this is going to be intense. Like, may as well just go and do some massive science -y degree. <laughs> um, but no, York was sort of genuine. It felt really genuine. And I thought, well, yeah. And I'm wanting to study a course that is genuine. I want to, I want to help people with things that you can't see, and I want to help people with uh, 
with yeah. difficult circumstances. And I thought that's going to be the right approach. I, I think you're right with how you said that because that's that's my feeling behind it as well. That I never wanted it to. It, I know I know exactly what it is. It's it's the, the punk rocker in me. It's always been the case. I don't I don't like fakeness. I never have liked fakeness. Authenticity. It, it's always got to be about that. And and Bradford were very authentic. Whereas I got the impression I would, even though I'm it face to face and stuff like that, I would given the impression I was just a number to other universities. Yeah. You're just an applicant. Yeah. You're just an applicant number. It never were like that with Bradford. And do you know what? I think obviously for yourself without knowing your answer, I think you're just going to go down the same avenue with me, but it, it happens the way it was always supposed to happen. I'm that, I think it's, I'm that life romantic kind of guy where I've always been saying where you've got to bring your own anxieties under control at best of times anyway, but I've always been that person that I, I try not to worry about what ifs and stuff like that. It's like you always end up yeah. exactly where you were meant to be in life. Yeah. You might it's go down different stuff. roads that take you down different you know, scenic routes and some are, some are longer, some are shorter, but you always ultimately end up exactly where you were supposed to end up. And Bradford were always supposed to be the university that, that I went to, that I just didn't know it. I had to learn some things along the way before I yeah, got to yeah. that. That's it. Yeah, yeah. You've just got to let, let life decide for you sometimes, haven't you, really? Like, especially what you're saying. Yeah. And yeah, we're both creative people. We've both got guitars on the walls. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, uh, we do like to be all the romantics and that's fine. And it's like, like I was saying earlier, being straight up with people. And I think that comes from my sort of creative side and also sort of my love of, of heavy music and, and, and just music in general. It's just that express yourself, like don't be a dick about it, but yeah. just express yourself and just yeah. tell people what you think, because the more you do that, life's going to be easier. Simple. Of course it is. Um, yeah, I'll just uh, I'll just finish up with the uh, the part of where you know where we're talking about uh, university and such like that. Um, yeah, it goes hand in hand for me now choosing Bradford. Choose Bradford because I'm able to do. Um, I do When I came down this field of creating this this brand of jukebox jacks, it was also the premise that when along the journey of mental health nursing, I'm going to be giving back and doing vlogs via YouTube, tracking the journey for a lot of other adult learners, but other obviously younger generations that's coming, you know, that wants to go out to university, right? But I don't want to get in debt. Yeah. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. So it's a way of me passing back that information. And another part of my personality is, is Harleys, motorcycles, always has been. So I'll be doing a motor vlog documenting obviously the Harley side of things but I'll also be doing the vlog for the nursing side so there'll be sometimes coming back from Bradford because I live in Castleford those people that don't know area is right. not too far from Leeds um so yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a good 30 minute on a good day probably more 45 minutes when it's you know busier traffic so if I'm coming from a placement in Bradford or university I've got a nice run at road where I can get helmet on get vlogging and just record some of from what's happened that day without going into detail, but passing back little bits of snippets to help people along. That'll be awesome. That's, find... that's really good. That's really creative <laughs> as well. The use of your time. And, that, and it's really... I sort of found it's, it's that, you know... Reflect. Yeah, well, as well, when I decided that I was going to go down this route of obviously the access cars, from someone that's been out of education as long as they have, even when I went on YouTube like the the weren't the resources available and all all I kept getting is oh just just ring you cast and it's like I don't particularly want to speak to someone because I don't know what I want to do I just want to I want someone to, to tell me what I need with without yeah. me even asking kind of thing so I thought do you know what there's there's a way around this there's a way of giving back to people along the journey until because the whole premise was to be obviously a mental health nurse and to give back in the best way possible. But how can I give back while I'm not registered? And that's yeah. how this whole this whole content came about from the channel. The same way that we're obviously we're going to be releasing merchandise very soon, like June onwards. And 75% cool, of the proceeds are going to mental health charities like Mind and, th and places like that. So, yeah, we're not in it to be rock stars. We're not making money. It's, 
out of like a 15 quid t-shirt we might see about two quid and that's shared between two of us <laughs> so. yeah no, that's that's good man that's good and it's it it will it will be hard to keep up that momentum potentially during your course in, in regards to sort of doing the reflections and the vlogs and stuff but make sure you do like please do yeah um i was the same as a student nurse in terms of wanting to like contribute whilst studying and i did all sorts of stuff and it went down various different avenues um and it was it was amazing to be fair i did some really cool stuff yeah um, and i've actually i've got an opportunity for you which i'll speak to you about after which yeah, i yeah. think will yeah. be good for you um but um i've done all sorts like i've, I've ended up going um to quarterly meetings um set up by the chief nursing officer ruth may and and Oh, you're back. Sound went. <laughs> oh, it's all right. You do you know me? what? Yeah. Do you know what a lot of people say to me when it comes to the editing of these stuff? They're like, no. your, your episodes. Hang can't. on one sec. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. I can't hear you. Can you hear me? <laughs> I'm, I'm like second. moving further to the mic. I don't know why. It's not going to help. It keeps saying that my buds keep trying to connect, but then... I... I can hear you. I know why. Let's see if I can, I can hear, hear you. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Do you know what? Right. <laughs> no, no. I was just saying then, a lot of people, when it comes to the editing of the episodes, they say to me, how much mm. slicing do you do in the editing? Because it can't run as smooth as that. Like, even you told us, <laughs> you told us about the Tony one. But yeah, it it just it were an abrupt transition straight into the the part two of it, and I were like, do you know what? I might moving forward, I might just leave in some parts so you can see the connection sort of issue. So these last couple of ones that's happened, yeah, I'm yeah, just, I'm just gonna leave them in because it's quite funny hearing your voice. Yeah, it's that's like robotic. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what's been happening. Like, don't trust Samsung. Let's put it that way. Samsung and ThinkPad clearly don't work well together. Um, anyway, what was I saying, dude? I was saying, yeah, like, so I got I got involved in loads of stuff. It started really from something called the Student Leadership Program, um, which was set up by the Council of Deans of Health, and like I applied to it, and it was like the 150 leaders, um, and it was essentially the future leaders of the healthcare profession ah. which was you know it was pretty cool for it's pretty cool for my ego because i was like yeah i'll do this <laughs> um and it was an amazing opportunity because i met i met some amazing people um, and and i was mentored by some really interesting people and off the back of that i got other opportunities um and i like i was saying before i got involved in this uh, health and wellbeing reference group which i'm still involved in now um and we meet quarterly and that was set up by Ruth May, the chief nursing officer, um, and that's speaking about um, the, the basically NHS policies that affect the the health and wellbeing of the of the national nursing workforce, ah. and there's some you know, really interesting people involved in that group. Um, and as a student nurse, I think when I first joined, I was a second year student nurse. I went off to London. Uh, you know, I went into this room to meet with people and we were in just sort of this conference room around a big table. And I felt like a very, 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 very little fish. You know, very, 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 very <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, and I, I was looking around and I was like, wow, so you're the chief executive actress, you're the chief executive actress. And then, like, at the end of the meeting, they were like, oh, yeah, and then uh, Ruth May, the chief nursing officer, is going to come and uh, join the next meeting. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she did... And, and, and and actually, like that, it brought home to me what what nursing is, which is you can, you'll do well in nursing if you're a genuine person, and and actually all these people, you know, they they have the big scary job titles and they have, um, you know, and they do really important things. Like how many how many times has Ruth May been on the COVID yeah. briefing on on yeah. on the news a couple of times, but actually. She's a, she's a really lovely, genuine person and she takes time out of the day for people. So, like, I got a note, I got a little postcard from her that just said, um, well done on your degree result. Like, handwritten, well done on your degree result, Felix. Like, keep going. Posted to my house and I looked at it, I was like, whoa, 
literally the day previous, she was on BBC News, <laughs> 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 the briefing next to, Bo- next to Boris. And I was like, wow, you like, the, the world is on fire and you've got time to, to send a little postcard to little old me. And I, haven't, I don't feel like I've done anything necessarily really special, but wow, what a thing. Like, yeah. and, and I think that's really important. And the people that, people that keep that level of sort of, you know, integrity, I guess, and, and keep that level of personal connection to people across all fields and all levels and all bandings within the NHS and the people that do well, um, I think they're your special Which is individuals important. in it's life important. as well. I think I think there needs to be more people like that in life because that can get lost along mm. the way. People can, you, you'll know from mental health field. There's that there's that reference to the spotlight um, premise that everybody goes through life thinking there's a spotlight shining on them and everybody's watching them, yeah. whereas ev- people don't realise that everybody else thinks they've got their own spotlight shining on them. And I think life can become very much like that. So. It is nice to know that someone at her level still has that underlying love for what she does and for humanity in general, where she just she always wants to give back in some way. It might be the littlest things that might have took her what two minutes out of day, but it's it stayed with you since, and obviously you're still obviously expressing it now as well. So it, it means a lot to other people, the littlest things that people do. So it is nice to know that she did that. Hundred percent. Um, yeah, she's probably forgotten now that she's done that, but it's it's like you say, it's the little things, isn't it? Do you know when you were saying about the the the, the little fish in in the big pond? It I don't know why I don't even know if you've seen the film. If you've seen the film, I'm hoping you have because you seem like a cool dude. The crow. Brandon oh, I'm really Lee. sorry, man. I've not seen it. No, oh, no, I've not seen it. Watch <laughs> it. Watch it. I promise you. The, okay. the, there's a bad guy in it. It's called Skank. And he refers to himself as a little worm on a big fucking hook. And when you said that, <laughs> <laughs> oh, instantly, yeah. It's uh, it's the immortal film when uh, Brandon Lee, Bruce Lee, son, died. Um, he got shot by a, one of the prop guns. Um, I know it, man. Like, th- this is an issue as well, because I know that the band will watch this. So, so <laughs> don't be shouting. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, the will, the will, and, and I know Ray, Ray, the bass player is going to go absolutely nuts because like he's obsessed with Bruce Lee and all that. Yeah, literally, and, uh, you'll yeah, you'll he'll watch this and he'll just he'll just be reeling loads of quotes to your front movie. Skank, yeah, skank, yeah. skank, dead. And you're like, I've still. Well, that, that, that's that's what my relationship with Ray is is based on. Essentially, us sitting and him quoting movie quotes at me, and me just looking at him blankly and going, oh, "Why don't you get it?" That's the one. Oh wow. It. There it is. I rec- I recognise the artwork and everything, man. Yeah, yeah. I've not seen it. It's it's nursing, you see. That's what that's what it is. It takes your life away from it. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Um, um, right. Let's get into this very cool T-shirt, man. Yeah, man. It's very cool that's where T-shirt. It's at. So, um, yeah, I spoke to you before episode. We're, we're going to do something quite cool afterwards. I'm going to. Uh, get you to kind of, you know, plug the tour that you've got coming up and stuff in like a separate video that I'm going to share around the release of the clips before we get to the full episode on Monday. So yeah, I release clips Saturday, clips Sunday, and then Monday full episode gets uh, put up, uh, up line. Um, and obviously throughout this episode, uh, there'll be loads of, um, of overlays and advertisements coming up. Um, I'm pretty certain I've already sent you the the ads and stuff, but if I am, as soon as I come off, I'll, I'll get them sent across to you. I think you'll be quite happy with them. Um, oh. But yeah, um, old tells. I know you touched on it earlier on. Can I just say, I'm, I hate being one of them people that, because I try to steer away from doing it. I love all the songs, but I think you know, think you know because of what I've been sharing recently. I swear to God, seat in the hall. Jesus Christ, what a catchy song, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's got, Glad you I, like it, man. I, I think I think you've totally gone from it from the creative side of things, but it's got a very Game of Thrones feel to it. <laughs> yeah, that's cool that you say that, man. It's it's probably it's the most progressive song on on the EP. Um, yeah, that, I'm really glad you said like Game of Thrones like like style to it. Um, it's it's an interesting song. It's. I, I know we will say we won't go down. We won't go down the road of sort of governments and stuff, but it's about it's about the government. <laughs> and we've been asked in previous interviews, oh, where where do you stand on talking about the government in your music and stuff? 
And actually, you know, if you've got an opinion, you're entitled to it. And I'm not calling anyone to see you next Tuesday in the lyrics, so it's fine. Yeah, it's straight away the the lyrics within it for me and obviously there's like i've said there's loads of information coming up throughout episode for those people watching um on youtube those people that's listening check literally check out old selves on um on spotify apple wherever you get your music sourced get them checked out um but the, the specifically this song for me I've always, like, anybody who's got me on Facebook personally knows that I've got a certain umbrella graphic as my cover photo. Anybody that knows bands well knows the umbrella is Bring Me the Horizon. I absolutely yeah. idolise Throne because of the lyrics, because of the same setup. So as soon as I heard that start, Seat in the Hall, my, it, it was as if it were a continuation of Throne. Oh, like, oh, that's cool, man. Yeah. Because as we know as well, they, I mean, they wrote it for different reasons, Throne, Bring Me The Rides, and they wrote it because they were fans of Game mm. of Thrones. That's why they had the throne in it and stuff. But the lyrics are very similar because it's all about adversity, not going with the flow of, you know, things above people telling you what you should do, what you shouldn't do. Um, yeah. So, yeah, no, man, props to you with that. That is brilliant. And my ad. Fulford Arms in background. That's just, it's just ace on both fronts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, absolutely. Um, I think it's it's funny that actually the, the, you find Throne and Seat in the Hall in like sort of similar in sounding and meaning, and, and essentially the song title is basically the same as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what's, what's the Seat in the Hall? It's a Throne, isn't it? It is. Um, it is. I'm just I'm just distracted in my mind um, because we did an interview as a band uh, a couple of months ago, and I, I I'm not the usually the best at interviews, believe it or not. I think I'm worse when I'm with the other guys because I'm like nervous about what they'll say. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, he was like, "Oh, so seat in the hall, love that song. What's it about?" And I was like, "Well, when I was writing it, I just imagined a big seat in a hall, and that was my answer." <laughs> and he was like. Okay, <laughs> and then Ray was like, "Oh, it's about this. It's about this." But, uh, <laughs> it's, yeah, I love that song, and uh, it, it's difficult writing political songs. But I, I remember at the time we were in the thick of the pandemic when I wrote it, and I was really pissed off. I was yeah. really pissed off. Um, same with Population; those two are sort of mainly politically driven. Um, not too strongly politically driven, I might add, but um, just sort of my thoughts and feelings about things in general. Um, just sort of like, just to just to quote some lyrics, because I know a lot of people struggle to sort of understand it if they don't listen to heavy music all the time. Um, like, population, clapping your way out of a slap in the face for us. So, like, I love that lyric and I love screaming it, because I remember writing, I was when I was writing that song, um, they were on TV. They were doing live footage of, of, of Nigel Farage and other people outside the houses <laughs> with, with like hands and stuff. Like, Ugh. and I just, thought, <laughs> and I just thought, dude, like he's just like something else had happened just before that, and they'd absolutely shafted nurses. And I was just thinking, oh, like no, you, you are literally clapping your way out of this. Like yeah. you're clapping the way out of it to cover the fact that you're just slapping us in the face. Uh, and I, I just thought I'm just going to write that as a lyric. <laughs> it's um, yeah. it's quite funny. Obviously, last week's episode had um, I've always seen him as family. He's not a friend. Um, he's more family. He's always been family. Uh, Tony uh, from Dying Degree. Obviously, he's in Perth, Australia. But yeah. he was he was saying that his his writing style. He very much he don't go into it with an idea of a such. He just dumps. He just dumps yeah. emotionally how he's feeling. And you, like I could see at a festival, Dying Degree and Old Selves playing, but collaborating because you and Tony, vocally, very similar. Are we? Yeah, you're very, very similar. Like they've just, I mean, his... uh, just released a new single, Gitai, Um, And it's, it, as funnily enough, you described it the same as what he, what he does, where people, if, they don't, if they're not familiar with Old Selves, People might describe it as quite shouty music, and it's like it's, it's not shouty. There's just passion behind the vocals. That's all it is. Yeah, yeah, which is interesting because a lot of people that like I've spoken to other heavy vocalists and people that listen to heavy music, and they're like, "Wow, your enunciation is really good when you scream." 
where it's like then there's other people that are like what the f are you say <laughs> but i guess it's it's about what you listen to and uh, and there's studies out there isn't there people that listen to heavy music and like metal music like the, the brain develops yeah. just to be able to sort of understand kind that dialect of, like more in tune to it yeah kind of, yeah as, as in like you know people like myself like grew up listening to kill switch engage and things like that so yeah it becomes yeah. second nature and more importantly to those other people that that have them comments and don't really understand oh i'm not listening to that i can't understand what you're saying turn genius on on spotify stop being lazy like genius <laughs> is there for a reason <laughs> yeah 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 that's it exactly and, and i remember when i was obviously much younger and i started to listen to heavy music and i couldn't understand what they were saying but I listened to it because of the guitar, like I was well into the guitar, so that's how I got into it. And then the more I listened to the guitar, I started to pick up the vocals. We're not speaking a foreign language, but like you say, we're just passionate. We're just, and, and I always, I always say, oh yeah, old selves, we're just a bunch of angry old dudes. Well, we're not old and we're not angry. <laughs> like, we're neither of those things, but actually, you know, I, that's other people's perception of us is that we're angry, but we're not, we're really not. And we're just, we're actually the, the softest bunch of lads ever. We hate confrontation, and 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 you know what I mean. Like we never argue. We've never had an argument face to face like the four of us because we just won't be able to do it. We'd all just end up like crying in the corner of the room, <laughs> all laughing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, I think and and it goes without saying. And I definitely don't need to tell you this, but maybe to tell some people that are watching this is that the metal community is the kindest, most loving, most compassionate community going that I've ever had exposure to in my life. Um, you you fall down, they'll pick you up. Simple as that. And and I think that's why I was so excited to speak to you as well about these two topics because I do that in my career, but also like I want I want to be doing that in music too. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I think that's again without speaking for you, I think that's why we may have resonated towards the sort of musical interests that we have because yeah. it was a sense of community, and that's where it then extends to mental health nursing you know, supporting one another. And like you said, you wouldn't think that on the outset, you know, you see a lot of hairy bikers or bald-headed bikers that like, you know, download and stuff like that. It's like, oh, you know, it's just going to be fighting and all they do is yeah. spinning that circle, punching each other. And it's like, it's not, <laughs> it's not what goes on at all. <laughs> no, no, no. It, I've never been hurt in a mosh pit. Yeah, I've been a bit sore afterwards, but never been hurt. And, and I once got a black eye and the guy that did it was utterly devastated. And he, and he was like, he was a scared, and he was like proper beefed up, covered in tats, and like you, like you know, Deirdre down the street would see him and she'd be terrified and like hiding, hiding this in an alley. But yeah. actually, this guy was like, I am so sorry, like I've never done that to somebody in a mosh pit before. I, I, what can I do? Like, can I get you a taxi home? And I was like, a proper kindness to him. Yeah. Accidents happen. Like it's absolutely fine, but. I can almost guarantee if that happened at another gig, I'm not going to talk about genres because it's not there's no point. But yeah. it, if it went, if that happened at another gig, a massive brawl would have kicked off. Like yeah. it, it really would have done. But but uh, at that gig, it was a heavy metal gig, and people were like, "Oh shit, this dude's got a black eye, his nose is bleeding. Let's just get him out safely. It's all good." And and that felt great. I didn't give a shit about the fact I had a black eye. <laughs> Well, the thing is that that guy you've described, I think, is pretty much the same guy that goes to every festival as well. Like, he'll go to every festival and he always ends his sentences with flower or petal. Like, you wouldn't yeah. expect him to be so sort of like mild mannered yeah, when yeah. you talk to him because he's got piercings in his face, he's got tattoos up his neck, he's, he's got like a skull tattooed on the back of his skull. And you would, yeah, yeah. just wouldn't, I think it's that whole thing about society in general, the perception of people mm. the same that yeah. originally gave me the perception when i'd said it to some of my close friends that for some reason hadn't been listening all them years when i'd said i wanted to go into the profession and they were like oh tattoo sleeves tattoo on your hand and stuff you the, yeah, the yeah. nursing's never gonna let you in there and i'm like are you for real didn't a surgeon carry out like a triple art bypass on your mum and he had two sleeves and neck tattoos like <laughs> it doesn't change his ability <laughs> yeah, exactly. to do a job <laughs> No, it doesn't, man. It doesn't. And that's it. It's, I think society's scared of expression, isn't it, really? And I think we're all being morphed into believing that expressing yourself puts you at risk. And I think that also comes down to basic human instinct, doesn't it? Expressing yeah. yourself and showing your vulnerabilities is dangerous. And and 
And it it's not anymore. It. It's not. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not. I, I think a lot of time it bridges the gap and it helps in a lot of situations. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, it's just you, you know, we conversation alone, like the avenue that that opens up with, with patience, the avenues where it allows to break things down. They'll, they'll just sort of, you'll see a poster on the wall or something at home and you're like, oh, I like them. And they'll kind of look you up and down like, what, really? And it's, oh, I'm in the band myself. And then they're like, what, really, really? Yeah, 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 precisely. It precisely, like, like yeah. I've, I, I've cared for people that have, yeah, like you say, been into metal or even been in metal bands and and uh, sort of shared my interest with them and they've they've been shocked by it. Yeah. Really? Um. So yeah. Um. Obviously, I was super excited when I saw the uh, the announcement of you guys are you UK tour starting from July. Oh yeah, man. Oh, I mean, how much? It's, it's probably the stupidest question out of the entire episode. But how excited are you guys for that? We're pumped, man. It's our first tour, and it's it's a pretty decent one as well. And um, you know, we've put a lot of work into organising it, and there's a lot of people involved in doing that. And um, you know, sounds gone again. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Thing is, you hear me now? Yeah, we, we're saying all this no. for all that. No, no. Can you hear me now? Yep. No. Yep. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, I don't know what... Right, it's, it's a nightmare, this. All right, anyway, know. sorted. You can hear me. We're all good. Yeah, yeah where, where were we at now? So, we were talking about the tour. That's it, go In for July. Um, and, and yeah, we've, we've put a lot of work into organising it and um, can't wait for it. It's going to be great. Um, in terms of... Our first tour, it's an 80-day tour across the UK. We're playing some pretty decent venues. Um, it's it's going to be awesome. It's, you know, we're cutting our teeth, essentially. Um, we've got we've got a nice fan booked and we've got some places to stay on some of the dates, but other <laughs> dates we haven't. So that's going to be an interesting experience, either <laughs> running in the van or, <laughs> or finding somewhere to stay. Um, yeah, that'll be fun. But we basically we spent more money on a van. Uh, we were just going to get sort of like a minibus, but we've ended up getting like a massive um, splitter van with like reclining seats and stuff in it. Just because if it does go to shit and we have nowhere to stay, yeah. we can at least just sit in a reclining seat and get some kit. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it's really important. Like me and Tom, the drummer, we were speaking about it the other day, and we were saying. It's important we cut our teeth and it's important that we rough it and do these things because one, it will bring us all closer together, but two, how boring would it be if like you were in a real luxurious like sort of tour bus and like yeah. do you know what I mean? It would be stupid. So it's, it's all part of it's fun. the little things in it that add to the whole, you know, the journey and the story you're on. It's them things you're gonna talk about ten years from now. When you sort of yeah. sat there reminiscing and stuff, like, oh, do you remember that first? You know, remember his first gig? Oh my god, do you remember Van were in? Oh my word, do you remember trying to sleep and so and so was snoring while other were farting? Like I can't, like I couldn't sleep anyway. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Yeah, I mean, I think we've got pure luxury to be honest. We've got men's electricity in this van, so that's going to be like <laughs> that's going to be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is, yeah, you don't have to carry them portable chargers around with you that you get yeah, off Amazon yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, it'd be good. And like, we're really looking forward to it. There's some venues that are sort of putting us up and some that are putting us in D&Bs and stuff as well. So it's it's great. And it's nice just to see the kindness in the community, really. Like people being like, 
yeah, like, we'll book you and, like, here's what we'll offer you. And it's like, wow, thank you. Because actually, like, it sounds weird, doesn't it? Because you'd expect it to be like, oh, our band, like, says, oh, we want to play your venue. And the venue's like, yeah, let's have you. We'll pay you this, we'll pay you this. But actually, it's the other way around. Like, the band's got to be like, please let me play your venue. We'll <laughs> <laughs> and that's what it's like when you're a new band. It's as simple as that. But it's about... One thing that a lot of people have said to me sticks out to them is my level of respect and my attitude when approaching them for opportunities and for shows and stuff is that I'm not like, now then, we're a band, give a gig. Like, it's not like that. It's like, hey, here's how we can help you yeah. if you can help us. Yeah, and that's, yeah. at the end of the day, it's, again, it's business. It is business. But it's making sure that that then translates on stage and in person into creativity and into art and into connecting with people because unfortunately a lot of business has got to happen behind the scenes but then <laughs> yeah. on the face of it we're a band and we write music and we play music and just want to share it with people so i think it's a nice touch as well i mean i don't know if you, you specifically if you do it on purpose but it, it's a nice touch that obviously uh, your last gig is at fulford arms like it's like the coming home or like because a lot of people do stuff like that you know as the first one don't they to do it on the yeah. side, get them warmed up. But no, I, I always like to see things like that. obviously knowing you guys are quite local to that area. So as soon as I saw that that was last one, well, that and Santiago's leads, like them two go hand yeah. in hand. So then when obviously you'd put Fulford Arms, I was like, that's a nice touch. Yeah, definitely. And it was intentional, actually. Um, and, and yeah, a lot of people start in the hometown and then finish off. But we did want to finish off at home. One, because we'd know we'd have our own beds at the end of the night. <laughs> <laughs> but, but two, because the, the Fulford Arms is just, it's the holy grail for us. Like, it is, it's a, I mean, the guys, Chris and Chris and all the other staff, like Nathan and, and the other people that work on the bar, they're all just lovely people. And I go sort of, a fair way back with them. I used to work at the Duchess in York on the bar, um, and I know I know uh, Chris Tuke that from there and Nathan, um, and I just love that venue. It's not on, it's not a big venue, but it's got a bloody amazing sound system in it. Um, it's got a it's got a spec way bigger than you'd see in most venues of that size, and that's because it came out yeah. of the Duchess, yeah, which which was a massive venue that took like quite big touring bands um, to be fair the Wolf and Arms takes a lot of touring bands um, so yeah it would be great to finish it there because it would be like oh we're home <laughs> <laughs> let's just got, do this gig let's make the most of it and then let's go to bed <laughs> it's, it's always nice when you've got them venues as well and we've touched on it in previous episodes that obviously that's a main issue now coming out of pandemic and stuff that, that a lot of these venues have closed and stuff um but yeah, I always, I that's why I always resonate to them sort of venues, places like Fulford Arms and stuff like that. Because I'm from from the area that I live in, like the generation that we had that were literally fresh out of college and used to go straight there on dinner, even though we weren't supposed to. But we got we got to County House in Pontefract, um, right. and obviously that that shut a lot of years ago. But that's it's them sort of them areas where people were getting to play in the first, not even what ended up being the official band, but yeah. the first few instances of the um, getting together, jamming, trying out songs, and it was the platform for them to do it in. So I've always, I'm always an advocate for places like that, that it needs. Yeah. Well, that's even the simple things. That, I mean, I know was, they were named on, obviously, uh, UK tour information, but that's why I tagged in both of them as well. You know, I went on, found the, you know, the different social handles and stuff. Yeah. Just because it need the it's not, you need to give back in that way to them, so it's always yeah. nice. And it like yeah, so yeah, hundred percent. They give so much, and uh, you know anybody that runs a grassroots music venue like the Fulford Arms, you know I have the utmost respect for, and especially now after going through this period, yes, there's been sort of like culture recovery funds and and grants and stuff, but actually it takes a lot of balls. It yeah. takes a lot of balls, and and I've thought about it in the past. You know, like a couple of years ago, I was thinking, oh, I might sort of start putting money together and thinking about investing in a music venue or or part owning one that's already already existing. And um, and it's still something that's on the cards in the future, maybe. But I was just I was just thinking during the pandemic, I was like, 
fuck no. <laughs> that, that would be such a bad So, you know, I really do take my, take my hat off to them because they do so much for the community and they do so much for, for people's health as well. Yeah, they sell copious, amount, copious amounts of alcohol, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, but we all know that, you know, we're supposed to drink that in moderation. It's his own doing if we don't kind of thing. So I get what you're saying with that. Precisely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But copious amounts of good music and, <sighs> and uh, first opportunities for people is very important. Yeah, and there's there's obviously the gigs you go to and stuff. You're branching out and, you're, you know, new friendships, and, you know, new people in your life. Some, some of them people who, who go to a gig, they might be the only people they get to see in a week, in two weeks. And we talk about that during the pandemic, about elderly and stuff, but it happens with, with younger generations as well. Some of them have social anxiety issues or they just they just don't have a friend circle that's around them yeah. because they're, they're dealing with their own challenges. So some, some, some people sort of like disregard them and they just push them to one side because, you know, they're too troubled and oh, I can't, can't be dealing with their dramas. So they end up by themselves, but then they'll go to a gig and just befriend random people. And yeah. without gigs, without festivals, we've got nothing. We've got nothing yeah, at yeah. all. So it's, it's uber important. It's so important, man. It's amazing how that environment just gives people that confidence just to, to get involved and speak to people and meet people. Yeah, man. Look, I know you've got plans after. I don't want to keep you too uh, too much longer. I just um, I just want to take a couple of minutes out just to, just to thank you, man. It's it's been awesome. It's been an awesome catch up. Um, the music side of things, we could both talk forever, but it's it's nice to know obviously someone is passionate about mental health topics as well. Um, yeah, man. I could sit here and chat to you for ages. Honestly, I could. <laughs> Um, it's it's great, and I think we have conversations, and and obviously you come into a couple of shows on the tour, which will be great, and good to meet you in person, um, which will is a bizarre concept even still, you know, yeah. pubs and that are open, but you know it's still weird to say, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, and and your passion is very evident, and uh, I respect that very much. Um, on a closing note. And I can't believe I even said it all episode. I've been waiting to say it like that that shirt, Tony Ark too, my word. There we go. Now we're living the dream. <laughs> hey, it's awesome. I'll I'll um I'll I'll do a little plug as well. It's I can't remember what I think they're called um fucking hell, I want to get it right now. I think they're called Death Cult Apparel. Yeah, um, I've heard of them. Yeah, yeah, they do some really cool shirts. Um, they do like limited runs of stuff like just for like a few days um, and you get your order in um, but yeah they do some really good stuff and um, as long as you don't mind I am um, plugging do it man because <laughs> I want sponsors <laughs> do it man do, do it do it check out um, what's the other one um, Unhinged Skulls check them out as well um, I'm a, I'm a fan of that oh yeah. dude go on like, like all, all of the, all the alternative clubbing like labels that like people go for it, don't they? And they're like, oh, I want to do it, but some people do it really, really well, and uh, and obviously they they bring back stuff like this, which is just like awesome because <laughs> I love that game, I loved it so much. Um, yeah, and it, I just wanted to mention as well because I, I kind of need to, but he's also an awesome dude. He's in America. He's called Living Dead Apparel, um, and they're. They're sending us a load of gear for our tour, and we're going to be wearing it on the tour as well. So I better mention him. Um, he's an awesome guy, and uh, I'll send you some stuff. Though, if I want to get it as well. Yeah, send me uh, send me social stuff, and then uh, obviously on um, I can uh, yeah I'll I'll stick it on the um, you know the Spotify description on the episode. Yeah, yeah. I can Sweet link man. in stuff. So send me links for that, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll do it. We name drop a lot of things in these episodes, so. If my memory goes a good bad, I always apologise to these people we've mentioned and not give them shout outs. But yeah, I'm definitely That's saying solid. it on air that as long as I get the info, I'll uh, I'll tag it in. But but yeah, man, thank you. I can guarantee you. this is not going to be the first episode that you're on. Um, but <laughs> all these people uh, that I'm doing it with of season one and stuff, it's it's special to me because I know full well the they're on the beginning of a journey that I'm starting. So. I'm going to be reviewing yeah, it and keep coming back and, and obviously, and we'll sort it. But 
We've got yeah, a lot man. more to talk about, dude. A lot more. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and on, on that note, on that note, I'll close the episode and uh, we'll uh, yeah, we'll we'll go and have a chinwag before you go and have your lovely tea. Yeah. Um, listen, yeah, guys, yeah. thank you as always uh, for listening. Uh, when we started this channel, me and Smeg, we we couldn't imagine that after this short amount of time, we're fastly approaching one and a half thousand followers. We never did it for followers. It was more just to get people talking more than anything. And just due to the fact as inbox flares up like it does and we've got people talking to us from around the world, the message is being heard and people are actually opening up and talking. So we've already helped that one person. Everything else is a bonus. But as always, guys, just a final message. Uh, check us out on uh, YouTube. Check us out on Spotify. Um definitely head over and check out old selves you'll find them on all social platforms the adverts have been coming up throughout this on video format um and they'll be on the audio description in spotify as well um but yeah guys live life be kind and give back do that cheers <laughs>